there, beloved saints. I'm really upset. I had just recorded half this video, and a network error occurred, and I lost everything. So I'm going to try this again. Now, we're warned that grievous wolves would come in, not sparing the flock. They would corrupt the biblical gospel. The salvation message is that eternal life is a gift of God, period. There's an issue with repentance. People just don't understand repentance. Repentance for salvation is about what you're believing, what you're thinking. And I'm going to show you. There are places in scripture that talk about repentance from evil deeds and wickedness. And as a Christian, we should do that. But that's a daily thing. That is not something you do. Repent of all your sins or promise to repent of your sins to be saved. That is sin is transgression of the law. If you have to repent of breaking God's law, then you have to keep the law and Jesus. You believe in Jesus. It's not by works of keeping the law and Jesus. It's That's trusting yourself. The repentance here is to change your mind about how righteous you think you are. How you're going to get to heaven. How good you are. And change your mind about who Jesus is and what he's done. Put your faith in him. Now, repent just means change your mind. You can uh, have a sandwich, but repent and order a salad. You can, it is not a religious word in general. It's just been adopted religiously, and people automatically add the words of your sin or say to repent means to feel guilt and sorrow for something. And that is one word, metamelami, but the Greek word metanoia or metaneo just means change your mind. And then you have to look at the surrounding uh, words and the context of what is being written to determine what it is you were to change your mind about or like turn towards repentance towards God and a faith towards Christ. So the way we turn to God is to trust that Christ died for his sins, that he was buried and he rose again the third day. And because he did that, we have everlasting life. A lot of people believe their sins are forgiven, either part or some, but they don't believe they have eternal life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, he said. And so sadly, most professing Christians don't believe that they have everlasting life because of what Christ did. And that is unbelief. So I'm going to show you here. We're warned about the leaven of the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees were strict law keepers. In addition to that, they also believed in works righteousness and added to God's law. Now, during the four Gospels here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Israel is still under the Old Covenant. Most people don't get it. The point of the Old Covenant is to show everyone their guilt. To be a schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ. Just to put everyone to the end of themselves. To be like, wow, I really do fail. Uh, so I need a Savior, right? That's the point. To make sin exceedingly sinful. And Jesus uses that lawfully. He uses the law lawfully. In the uh, rich man story, well, you know the commandments because he claimed to have kept them all, meaning he thought he was righteous. I'm going to show you where God does that, but it's it's difficult because spiritually blind people cannot see it. Now, this is I'm not trying to insult people. I'm nothing special. I am just a sister in Christ. God's given me a little gift to make things that seem complicated simple. And I'm able to encourage uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's all. If you're offended by a, a woman, you don't think God can use a woman, I can refer you to wonderful men of God. Uh, Ralph Yankee Arnold, Dr. Uh, Andy Woods, uh, uh, Pastor Tim Henderson, um, many people. Okay? Um, because if, if you think those verses mean what most people think they mean that I don't want you to do anything against your conscience so um, I am going to go over Matthew 20 let me get myself straight here Matthew 20 and Matthew 19 okay guys so I'll be there and I'll do a, I have a little bit in Acts okay in Acts uh, 20 as well but uh, I want to show you here that what they needed to repent about was had nothing to do with sin. These people were strict law keepers. Why would he tell them to keep the law more strictly? So what they needed to repent about is believing in Jesus. Okay, we see that when they're discussing John's baptism, which is what I'm going to show you. 
Now, uh, people will see these things very legalistically and miss the whole point. But uh, I'm going to show you right here. If you go over to Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 23. Now, this is Jesus. When he had come into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came in unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned within themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Then he goes on to continue to preach to the people. Now listen to what he says. I've used this parable earlier in a video the last couple months. It's about the two sons sent to work in the vineyard. And this represents those that are supposed to look like they're godly versus those that look really sinful but are really doing what God said to do. And this is also prophetic of Israel as a nation and then Gentile nations as well. Not just uh, this particular thing where it's talking about the priests and the Pharisees, right? It's also talking about um, those that the world condemns as great sinners, but God says are doing exactly what he asks. So they don't look like it, but they are. So let's look at this. Jesus tells this story and he says, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. Has nothing to do with sin. He changed his mind. He wasn't going to go, but then he was like, Ah, eh, Dad asked me, I better go. Right? So he changed his mind and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go. I go, sir. He actually, oh, yes, daddy, I'll go, but went not, okay? Whether the twain did the will of his father, they say unto him the first. Jesus says to them, verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Whoa, that, that probably made him a little mad. These are religious people. Why? Because they... They claim to do God's will. They say they're going to do what God says to do. But don't do it. But the publicans and harlots, they don't go around saying, I do God's will. But they do it. What was that will? It's to believe on Jesus. This is You, you can know that John the Baptist, the repentance he preached... Why would he yell at Pharisees that are keeping the law so strictly? Why would you think he's telling them to keep the law more strictly? He's the voice crying in the wilderness that's making the way for the coming king. He's telling them to believe on Jesus as the lamb who who dies for the sins of the world, who takes away the sin of the world. People just don't believe this. So he continues, for John came unto you in the way of righteousness. That's John the Baptist. And you believed him not. This is about what they believe. The people want to mock it as easy believism. It's ridiculous. Work your way to hellism. That's what I say. Work your way to hellism because salvation is not of works. And the way these preachers have people twisted up is to use the lip service that it's a free gift. Eternal life's a free gift. Salvation is of grace through faith alone in Christ alone. But you got to repent of all your sins and give away everything you own and follow him and pick up your cross. All these are discipleship. And by the way, all of those things are good to do. And there's something every Christian should do on a daily basis. 
but that's not how we're saved okay in addition they just like the pharisees of that day put a burden on men's shoulders and won't lift a finger to move it they added to the law of god started reading the talmud which were rabbinical teachings and made like the sabbath you can only take x amount of steps or you've broken the sabbath okay god never said any of that so they would add things like that heavy burdens okay but they were also those who believed that the righteousness of the law would save them it won't it's never saved anyone because of the infirmity of our flesh the weakness of our flesh that which should have been life was death to us paul says that i had not known sin i had not known lust until thou shalt not covet and it says that the that by the commandment he died sin revived he died and the commandment slew him killed him now that's using the law lawfully showing people their guilt under the law but you don't turn around and say now keep that law and believe in jesus to be saved no that's not how it works not how it works at all so he tells them you didn't believe john's message this is about believing so repentance here is about them changing their mind to believe on jesus listen to what he says John came unto you in the way of righteousness. What is that? By faith in Christ. And you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when you had seen it, repented not afterwards that you might believe him. It's all about believing. They needed to repent. They needed to stop what they thought and that was they are so righteous and that they're going to be saved by the law and that they're good in God's sight and trust Jesus as Savior that's why the harlots and publicans get in they know they're sinners that's why it says um, if we say we have not sinned we deceive ourselves the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us all sins cleanse us from all unrighteousness so this is what first john's talking about the unsaved the the uh, false apostle versus the true apostle admitting you're a sinner versus claiming you're not one this isn't a burden to lay on you to constantly confess something and john came in the way of righteousness paul says john verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on the one who comes after him that is christ jesus the repentance there was to change your mind from thinking um i'm a child of abraham so i automatically am saved through your genealogy thinking that you're going to be saved by the law and your own righteousness and put your faith in jesus as the promised savior it says right here you repented not afterwards that you might believe him when the disciples and jesus see the rich young ruler look how he uses the law lawfully to show this man his guilt it is unfortunate that people like john MacArthur look at it and go see you must sell everything that you have and give it and then uh, give up everything and pick up your cross to be saved that's to be a disciple i will show you where he says he will reward the disciples was a very specific reward that has nothing to do with salvation these things have to be put in context it's just ridiculous but he that's what he tells people he hasn't done that do you see how they they tell you they talk out of both sides of their mouth he hasn't sold everything and gave it to the poor and followed jesus not to the there's no way he hasn't nobody's done that all right so this is where the disciples uh and jesus are walking and the rich young ruler comes and he says behold one came and said unto him good master and this is something muslims use to claim see jesus isn't god no this he knew this man only acknowledged him as a rabbi not as the son of god and why would you call him good if you don't believe he's the son of god right uh w w the bible is taken as a whole there's places that say he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He set aside some of his divinity to be human, to die for mankind. So it, it, it's spiritually discerned, first of all, 
Secondly, it, you've got to look at the whole of the scripture. So, because I've had people come to me and say, see, Jesus told us you get everlasting life by keeping the commandments. Did he? Okay. See, that which should have been life was death to us. He's using the law lawfully to show this man his guilt. This is why he's sad. Okay. Well, one came unto him as a good master. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And by the way, Jesus ups the standards for these. If you even look at a woman with lust, you did commit it. So he shows the standards even higher than we realize. He's using the law lawfully there so that people, you know, your right hand offends, cut it off. Right? So, and he says, honor thy mother and father, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Oh, have you? Okay. Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give it to the poor. And thou shalt have great treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Had he kept them? No, no. Jesus showed him, you, you haven't kept all the commandments. You trust in your riches. You love your riches more. But see, that, that's the thing. He wasn't going to be saved because he gave away everything. Jesus knew he wouldn't do that. It's to show him his guilt, okay? He needs to realize he needs a Savior. And you'll see that here. Now, this is important. Then said Jesus to his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who can be saved then? So, this is exactly where everyone should be. My goodness, if that's the standard, who could stand? Who could be saved? And I remember that night I got there. Well, Lord, who could stand? And I heard, exactly, exactly. I needed him. Oh, what relief. The law made me guilty. And I never again looked back to see if I was living up to it. Because I knew I wasn't. No matter how much progress I make, I never think I'm doing it enough. That's why I trip out when people go, I don't sin, or I haven't sinned since so and so. I just laugh. And then I get really sad because how, how deceived. So the disciples, you got to remember, think about back to Job. People thought that if you were financially blessed, that God was with you. You must be a godly person and had God's blessing like Abraham or Solomon, right? Bad things don't happen to people of God that are good, godly people. Remember Job's friends? You must ascend. No, all that God has to do is drop his hedges for a second and the enemy pounces, right? We have no idea how gracious God is and how much of a protective hedge he puts around us. Or we'd be devoured. The devourer would come and take it all. So they're amazed because they're like, whoa, uh, we, you know, I think rich people are obviously blessed by God. And if they can't get in, who can? Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible. Not difficult. Impossible. But with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said to him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me 
In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Is that eternal life or is that a reward? A special reward, clearly. It's a reward. Eternal life is the gift of God, not of works. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit dwells in us the moment we trust Christ. It tells us that in Ephesians. Now, if you're trusting in repenting of sin or not sinning, which is keeping the law, and Jesus, you're not trusting Jesus. And it's not a gift. It's not by grace through faith. And then you'll hear the argument. Well, it's God's grace working in me. Well, that might be so. Let, let's say that's so. It is not the work Christ is doing in you either. It is the work he did on Calvary. It is not about us, people. The message of the gospel is that we will never die. Because Christ died in our place. Receive the gift of eternal life. Because Jesus died to give it to you. And what comes with that? Forgiveness of sins. Reconciliation with God. Peace with God. You're adopted into God's family. Now because of this you have a new identity. When we're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into his death. We should arise and walk in newness of life. That's a daily fellowship and growth maturity issue not salvation these people are wrong they are preaching another gospel let them be accursed i am so tired of this lie they lay a burden on you that's impossible these people have not repented of all their sin and if you don't have to repent of all of them, it's not perfect repentance. Why are you adding it anyway? You can't even bring it in. It's what Jesus did or what you did. Not both. It can't be. Because it's no longer grace if it's of works. Now it's God owes you something. But what does he owe you? Because it's filthy rags. He owes you death. Don't bring your works. You will be found wanting. Bring the work of Jesus Christ only. Nothing should come out of your mouth if someone asks you, why should you get to heaven? Because Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. I trust he saved me. That's it. Now look at Acts chapter 20. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Perverse means twisted. Twisting the gospel, troubling them, shipwrecking their faith off the foundation of Christ alone. Salvation through grace, through faith in Jesus. And now, brethren, it says, Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. What happened? Immediately. Even during his lifetime. You got to keep the law of Moses. and be, You got to be circumcised. And keep the law of Moses and be saved. It's not enough to just believe. Then they start incorporating works into the word believe. Faith is faithfulness. And obedience to the commandments. Look we are all for all of that. Should a Christian do sinful things? No it's destruction. We shouldn't do anything to destroy ourselves. Our family. Our church. Our, our friends. Our relationships. Our lives. Our body. But that's not how we have everlasting life. This is why I divide it. The gospel has to be kept simple and pure. He warned them, everyone, for three years, day and night with tears, that this was going to happen. Perverse means twisted. They twisted the gospel. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word 
of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified, set apart, made holy by God, for God, by the offering of Jesus' body once for all. That is in Hebrews. We are sanctified by the offering of Jesus' body once for all. We are sanctified by his blood. It tells us that clearly. Not by, are you living in holiness? These people actually think they are. Holier than the donut shop. Holier than Swiss cheese, I guess. Ephesians 3, 2 says, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, you word. We are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, period. Repentance is to change your mind from trusting in whatever you're trusting in. False religion, you need to repent of the repenting of your sins gospel. That's what you need to do. If you think you not sinning or turning from sin is helping you be saved, you better repent of that garbage. And come to the Lord just like you are. Now, if, if, if you do repent of sin that when you get saved, because you know you're a new creation now, great. You should. That has nothing to do with you getting saved, though. You come to him just like you are and say, I am a sinner. I need the gift of eternal life or I will die. And I believe Jesus for it. I believe he paid that debt for me. The wages of my sin, which was death. Because he died and he defeated death. And he says, because he rose again, I will too. That's evidence, I will too. You want evidence of your salvation? It's the risen Christ. The evidence of your salvation is the empty tomb. It's the promise of God. It is not you, your lifestyle, how much you repented of your sin. Give me a break. I am all for it. I'm for that. I'm for a Christian living a godly, loving life. Where's the joy? Where's the peace? Where's the love for the brethren? It's not there because the, the gospel has no power. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. For it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. And there's power in this gospel. Because it's the message of Jesus in all his glory. It's the message of God's love for you. Now, we should never boast in our love for God, but in his love for us when it comes to salvation. Do I love the Lord? You bet I do. But I know his love is way stronger, way better, more perfect than mine. Mine fails. I hope you guys can hear me. I don't promote wickedness. That's ridiculous. Anyone that knows me knows I do live my faith. But this is not about our faith being made alive or productive. James is talking about our faith being more productive, right? Being profitable. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about simple salvation, the gift of everlasting life. Keep that gospel pure and clean and all about Jesus, not you. It's not, you got two things to do, three things to do to be saved. You got to be willing to do this. It's not of him that willeth or of him that runneth, but of God who showeth mercy. I hope you guys can hear me. God bless you.